As art forms, musicals and movies are very closely intertwined. Singing and dancing started turning up in movies literally the moment sound was added to them, musicals were a staple of the Hollywood golden age, and while the latter decades have been hit and miss, the genre is enduring. Meanwhile, more and more stage productions have drawn inspiration from the movies, with results ranging from shockingly brilliant to, it's the thing you like but with singing, please buy tickets. And yet for all that shared history, musicals and movies remain dramatically different methods of storytelling. Film is an inherently visual medium, where the image tells the story as much, if not more, than anything written in the script. In a musical, the heavy lifting of the drama is done by the songs. You can surround your actors with spectacular stagecraft or give them a setting so minimalist as to be almost non-existent, but in the end, the emotional drive is going to come out of their own mouths. To demonstrate that distinction, let's look at the movie behind A Little Night Music, Summer Nuttons in the End, or Smiles of a Summer Night, written and directed by Ingmar Bergman. Smiles of a Summer Night was Bergman's first international success, and at the time, he needed it. His previous two films had bombed, and his producers were demanding something audiences wanted to see rather than moody existential drama. His third marriage was in dire straits, and his affair with actress Harriet Anderson was drawing to a close. And to top it all off, he was suffering from severe stomach pains and had lost so much weight that in 1955 he was down to roughly 125 pounds. But personal tragedy is often the foundation for comedy, and Bergman would later say that he had two options, make smiles of a summer night or kill himself. Thankfully for the film world, he chose the former. So here's how it originally went down. Meet Frederick Eggerman, disillusioned and depressed middle-aged lawyer. His second wife, Anne, is young enough to be his daughter and their marriage of two years remains unconsummated. His son, Henrik, is studying for the priesthood but still struggles with the ways of the flesh and his desire for his stepmother, and his fumbling attempts to deal with that with the maid Petra are not helping. Frederick, meanwhile, is dreaming about his previous love, the captivating actress Desiree Armfelt. He reconnects with her after one of her performances, where he meets her little son Frederick, who is probably his son too, but Desiree absolutely refuses to confirm that, and Desiree's current lover, the swaggering and jealous Count Carl Magnus Malcolm. Carl Magnus is also married to the loyal yet resentful Charlotte, who went to school with Anne and who, at his instigation, tells Anne that her husband's eye is straying. Desiree prompts her elderly mother to invite all these people to her country manor on Midsummer Night, where Desiree recruits Charlotte to pretend to seduce Frederick, thus inspiring Carl Magnus to reassert his devotion to his wife, detaching him from Desiree, who will then be free to do as she likes with Frederick. With me so far? So Henrik embarrasses himself at dinner by ranting about the other guest's lack of moral character and gets so dejected at the thought of a life of virtue that he tries to commit suicide. But he fails and instead activates a visiting royal demanded a secret entrance for his mistress switch, which catapults the sleeping Anne into his room. Anne and Henrik admit their mutual love and run off to Frederick's chagrin, but Frederick's evening is about to get worse as the Operation Jealousy Charlotte and Desiree have contrived works a little too well, and Carl Magnus challenges him to a duel via Russian roulette. Frederick gets the loaded chamber, but luckily Carl Magnus thinks too highly of himself to risk his life dueling with a mere lawyer and had only filled it with soot. As Desiree tends to Frederick's bruised ego and Carl Magnus promises to always be true to Charlotte in his fashion, Petra dallies with and rests an engagement from the stableman Frid, who explains that the summer night has smiled three times, for the young, for the fools, and for the lonely and dejected everywhere. This is a particularly good subject for discussing the difference between movies and musicals due to the high caliber of the respective creators. Both Ingmar Bergman and Stephen Sondheim are undisputed masters of their crafts, names invoked with the highest reverence by devotees of their mediums, and that provides an important contrast in the way they tell stories. Unlike some of Bergman's later films, Smiles of a Summer Night does have an underscore, which occasionally adds to the comedy, as with the dramatic martial fanfares that herald Count Malcolm's appearances, but it's generally used sparingly. The mood is generated by his evocative framing of the subjects and his use of visual motifs and symbols. Characters are often equated to performers in a play, being framed and observed as if on a stage. When Anne and Henrik run off, her veil falls to the ground, emphasizing that this is the end of her virginal state. 
As a composer, Sondheim's music is the most essential component in a Little Night Music's mood. Just as Bergman's theatrical motifs equate his failed and foolish lovers to characters in a farce, Sondheim presents their romantic entanglements and missteps as a sort of dance, scoring the entire show in variations of 3-4 waltz time. Instead of poignant vignettes detailing the abundant sexual frustration in the Eggerman household, we have a finely crafted interlocking trio. And instead of mood shots depicting the perpetual twilight of the Scandinavian summer, a Greek chorus sets the scene with an elegantly suspended melody. Most notably, a little night music shifts the role of the observer and commentator. In the Bergman film, this is a duty done by Frid, the pleasure-seeking, working-class servant who pierces through the pretensions and follies of his betters. Sondheim and Hugh Wheeler expand the role of Madame Armfeld, giving her a backstory as a celebrated courtesan, as well as making Desiree's love child older and switching the gender. Thus, it's Frederica, who has yet to experience love, and her grandmother, who has seen far too much of it, who are able to insightfully comment on the absurdity surrounding them. I wonder if this shifting of the story's voice of wisdom has anything to do with the creator's own experiences with romance. The often married, often adulterous Ingmar Bergman had what might charitably be called a complicated relationship with women, whereas Sondheim, well, he made love in a different key entirely.